Hey, Brittany here. And I'm Claire. And you're listening to Eco Curious, a podcast dedicated to bringing interesting, relevant, and local science to the masses. This podcast is created by the Petty Kodiak Watershed Alliance, a nonprofit environmental organization based in Moncton, New Brunswick. So, thanks again for taking time out of your busy schedule to come in and interview with us. So, we'll start off with the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. What is your position and could you walk us through your typical day at work? So I'm working as an aquatic science biologist in the inner and outer bay of Fundy, uh, Atlantic Salmon Assessment Unit. We're part of a larger division, which is known as the Population Ecology Division um, in the Maritimes region. And we are basically supporting conservation of Atlantic salmon in, in the Maritimes region in particular. So in layman's terms, uh, we assess, (laughs) we assess, look at salmon that are coming into our rivers in the inner bay and outer bay of Fundy regions and salmon that are leaving and try to figure out population dynamics and things that are related to salmon ecology. Mm -hmm. On a typical day, I tend to be working, I focus more on the inner bay of Fundy population um, with a little, I think I dabble a bit in the outer bay of Fundy program, but um, main focus is Inner Bay of Fundy, so that also includes the Pentecodiac River, for Ooh. those who don't know. I am in, in front of my computer 90% of the time, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I personally don't mind that. A number of tasks and projects that I'm working on right now are developing a model to estimate the number of returning adults to the Inner Bay of Fundy Rivers. Mm-hmm which, as I mentioned already, it includes the Petticodiac's Little and Pollock Rivers. A lot of the time I'm analyzing data to make recommend- develop recommendations for management on decisions relating to our salmon programs or to just in general assess the populations during, especially during this critical time, trying to figure out what, what's happening and understanding why uh, salmon populations are declining mm-hmm. so much. I also work I also help to provide advice or science advice to other DFO clients. They're basically other DFO clients would include conservation protection, so your fisheries officers, and then species at risk management people who are also to like regulating the Atlantic salmon, and then as well external stakeholders like you guys. Or a big one that we deal with is the Fort Folly Habitat Recovery, whose focus is on Petacodiac. Yeah. So that's kind of where we fit into the Petacodiac picture. Another program that I'm focusing on is the developing a genetic assessment program on the Outer Bay of Fundy Rivers. So we're basically trying to look at the genetics of salmon in those rivers because they are COSIBIC listed as endangered and are undergoing the SARA process right now to get that the endangered status. And once right. that happens, we need to be able to start to figure out okay, where, what state are the salmon in mm-hmm. on right. that river? And, well, we already know they're declining, but a next level to the population assessment is to say, okay, what is the genetic state of the, this population? Mm-hmm. Do we need to intervene any more than we already are with our supplementation programs? Okay. And Can you describe the benefit of genetic diversity in a, in a fish population? Yeah, it's just like any population. If you have more genetic diversity, you're going to have more more genetic diversity will mean that you have more mixing of Mm -hmm. your genes Mm -hmm. and it also helps to hide any of the detrimental deleterious genes that could be present in a system so if you have a lot of inbreeding where individuals are related what will happen is that if you have an in two individuals that have these deleterious genes Mm -hmm. Um, and they mate, mm-hmm. and those two genes, there's a better chance for those genes to come out, and you ha- could potentially have less survival, less reproduction. So genetic like diversity will increase the survival of the fish population? For sure. It would, it would definitely increase the survival. Like, it's a, it's a component of it. Mm-hmm. But basically, if you have more genetic diversity, it just masks those harmful harmful genes. So it would kind of reduce the probability that these harmful genes will then kind of give rise to Mm -hmm. trade and then progress throughout the population. Exactly. Right. It's basically your survival of the fittest and all the general big 
theory concepts <laughs> that Charles Darwin talked about. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. So how is the genetic diversity of the population looking like right now in the salmon, Atlantic salmon? That is a big question. That's that, a yeah, um, that is a huge question. Can't answer. Um, Would the inner bay of the salmon be more, I don't know, so studied in that? Or? The inner bay of Fundy salmon, there's very few of them. Compared to the Outer Bay of Fundy Salmon? Compared to the Outer Bay. We heard to they any... only found one this year at the Fort Folly Habitat Recovery. Oh, you mean at their fish traps? Oh, yeah, at yeah. the fish traps. Yeah. 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 So that would be adults. So yeah. Um, I haven't had any updates from them about how many fish they had come through mm -hmm. their arrays and whatnot, or how many adults, I should say. They had a number of smolt leaf, which was very exciting. Oh, they did very exciting. Yeah, they did. They had a number of smolt leaf, which is great. They were able to count a number a lot more than they counted in previous years. That's mm -hmm. exciting. We just did a quick swim through the Big Salmon River, which mm -hmm. is southern New Brunswick. We're St. Martins. We got 27 adults so far mm -hmm. returning. That is exciting. Which is exciting. Mm -hmm. It's the fact that we can count the number of salmon on our fingers is not exciting. But if you look at the whole inner Bay of Fundy population, what we're kind of estimating, which is what I'm working on mm -hmm. in, yeah. in with one of my projects, is we're anticipating that there, there's less than probably 100 fish in wow. the that yeah. are adults that are returning. For the inner, inner bay area? Yeah. Right. Wow. So... Could you compare that to like a healthy population of well, what the salmon used to be like? It would, the 20,000 that would come wow. back to, or more, would be inner bay. That's oh. crazy. Oh. Are you able to say like what? happen like why are their population so low marine survival okay marine survival is a huge is playing a huge um having a huge effect on the salmon populations what aspect of marine survival mm -hmm. we don't know there's a number of studies that are happening another colleague of ours david hardy is working on the marine Marine threats is his, his thing. So he's tagging a number of fish mm -hmm. and looking at predation, looking at where the fish are going. Well, there would be a number of that. threats that could possibly be doing it. And it would sure. be really hard to see that in kind of a non lab setting where you don't know where these fish are and, and once you're tagging them. And the thing is, like, any factor, like, it, the factors can change each year. Yeah. Like, yeah. you guys know as, as scientists yourself and still being relatively fresh. If you take in like a, a physiology course, mm -hmm. you think about your own body. Mm -hmm. Any one thing changes in your body, it's going to affect a number of different systems. Mm -hmm. So where people will point fingers and say, oh, it's this. This is causing salmon decline. Mm -hmm. I, it's my own personal thing. It's not a DFO science. But I still truly believe that it's a number of factors affecting salmon. Yeah. It is not going to be one thing that's causing the decline of Atlantic, the mm -hmm. Atlantic salmon species. Unless you say climate change, because mm -hmm. climate change could be that umbrella. Yeah, the umbrella that, that yeah, causes all, is these causing other causing all these other yeah. things yeah. to change. Which, yeah. yeah, like you've got increasing temperatures, you have different predation because of these increasing mm -hmm. temp temperatures. It also changes all the other fact, all the other quality and mm -hmm. the, yeah. the water chemistry. Yeah. So that if salmon can't adapt to that, mm -hmm. then they're not going to survive. Right. And the fact that you've got higher temperatures, you've got changing water, changing environment, whether that be marine or river, it's going to affect the salmon. But mm -hmm. the thing, the nice thing about genetics is that they're going to adapt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And things. But won't are, it take them a significant amount of time to adapt? Like it'll take genes, generations. Genes generations. don't change yeah. just over no. in one individual, right? They have to change oh, throughout. They don't. <laughs> no, but it has to go through generations to yeah. see those changes. You can't it's just have but, one individual in there and be like, oh, his genes will just, you know, just change. <laughs> but it's not like, it's, you have to part think part. about the fact that the environment is going to affect who survives. Yeah. Yes. And if it's a temperature thing, then the environment's going to say, okay, those who can survive this warm temperature are going to survive. They're going to pass their genes on mm -hmm. to the next generation. And that is what we're hoping is happening and right. um, again like I can't say what factors in particular but that like it could just be like it could, it could be a couple of generations and that could be 10 yeah. years. So this is what David is researching currently trying to kind of pinpoint. Well it's I factors. guess that's Dave, David's looking at um, 
right now he's focusing on predation and where fish are going. Right. Um, okay. There's other larger projects where they're actually trying to take all the populations of salmon on the eastern side of Canada mm -hmm. and looking at the a little bit more into their genetics and saying, okay, what are the similarities that we're seeing between all the populations with changes in genetics or with adults that are returning compared to the smolts that are leaving and mm -hmm. the smolts that are dying. Mm -hmm. Do we see anything that's similar? Mm -hmm. That's quite advanced research. Like genetic research is very It's the future. It's the future. <laughs> it's the future. And like I it's gonna become very like easier in the coming years with advances in technology. But yep. right now I feel like it might be a little I find it so complicated, you know? <laughs> it's complicated if you're not, like, involved in it on, yeah. like, a regular, like, a regular on a daily basis, basis yeah. right? Like, I only got involved in genetics. Like, during my undergrad, I never took a genetics course. Or oh, I took really? a couple of genetics courses, the yeah. ones that I had to take. Mm. And then I ended up working in a genetics lab in my undergrad. And that's where I learned everything I needed to know about mm -hmm. evolution and genetics and really more the applicable stuff as mm -hmm. opposed to theory that you learn. Mm -hmm. The hands-on experience. Like the laboratory. Exactly. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. yeah, because yeah. In, in like my evolution and my genetics courses, like they're very broad. They give you a lot of information, mm -hmm. but until you actually use it, mm -hmm. I I didn't really grasp, I guess I never really grasped, grasped yeah. the concepts yeah. until I was immersed in it for a year and a half. Right. And then it was like, okay. I get this stuff now, <laughs> but it is difficult. Like, yeah. yeah, to be able to explain a lot of the genetics concepts to people, you need to have background knowledge. You need to have yeah. background. You need to really be able to dumb it down, mm -hmm. and it's not actually as difficult as it sounds. And no, yeah. like it just, it just takes time and time to be able to explain it, and people wanting to learn. Have you seen? Are you guys looking at the genetic diversity between the salmon in the inner bay and the outer bay? You can't really, they're two different populations, so okay. genetic, like, if you, you can't talk really about them. broadly genetic diversity yeah. and say, okay, the genetic diversity of inner bay is going to be less than that of outer bay because the population is smaller. much smaller, yeah. that's what you'd expect. Okay. Um, so there's more differences between them than just the location? <laughs> yeah, well, so they're on different, they're on different rivers, right? So right. the outer bay, if you compare those to the inner bay, they have different life histories, mm -hmm. they have different migrations, and even if you look at subpopulations of like the outer bay or the inner bay, like every river is going to have a different different set of adaptations and different mm -hmm. set of life histories because right. it's, it's different environments and yes. that's just like us. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. how you have to think about And our environment us. has such an impact on what genes are kind of turned on or turned off and True. Exactly, and, 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 and life history, and like yeah. how you adapt to it, and how like what you need to do in order to survive. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so That's you're really gonna see exciting. big differences between the outer bay and the inner bay. Like the biggest difference between those two populations is that the outer bay of salmon, outer bay of fundy salmon, they migrate. The adults or the small migrate like as far as Greenland. <laughs> okay, so they do the far long wow. distance migration, wow. whereas inner bay, the small stay in the Bay of Fundy. Wow. However, there is an exception where one of our rivers, the Casparo River, salmon population, they actually go up to Greenland, but that's the only inner Bay of Fundy salmon that actually might, does the long distance migration. That is really interesting. So when you look at things like that, it's like, okay, this is what these fish do. Why do these fish do it? And that's where genetics comes in and population differences. That's what it's about. Those are two big examples of population differences. Mm -hmm. Right. Thanks so much. So, yeah. Well, getting back a little bit to you, <laughs> what uh, research experience or interest did you have prior to getting this position? I know we talked a little bit, but would you be able to expand on that? <laughs> yeah. So I started my career as a, science, a biologist, scientist um, at the University of Guelph. And I was studying, studying in the marine and freshwater biology program. Um, I completed my undergrad research, or I completed an undergrad research project there in evolutionary genetics, which um, was looking at rainbow trout and Atlantic salmon um, evolution. So that's where my roots of salmonic biology have, have come in. However, uh, comparing that to my position now, 
there are two different spectrums. <laughs> so in undergrad, in that project, I focused on genetics, and I was a lab rat, and I just looked at their genetics and figured out how their genetics related to different behavior and different physiological traits that we saw. Whereas my research now is looking at salmon ecology and how their biology and whatnot relates to their environment more so. So it was looking, I, I looked at small before and now I'm looking at the big picture. And I Which one do you prefer? The small or big picture? <laughs> so I really try to incorporate a lot of the small into the big picture. Yes. <laughs> because oh, I personally am a um, holistic biologist, I guess you can call it, where I really mm -hmm. believe that you need to have you need to look at all aspects. You need to look at genetics, physio mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. the physiology, behavior, as well as the ecology. It all needs to be combined in order mm -hmm. to get that picture. You can't just look at the ecology and say, okay, these fish aren't surviving. In order to figure out why, you need to be able to integrate all the other components to say what actually is going on. So that's how you um, fight the complexity of the big picture. Yeah. Break it exactly. down. Pretty yeah. much. And that's why I have been helping quite a bit with our... Um, genetic assessment program trying to get involved in the larger projects mm -hmm. that are trying to determine what is happening with the salmon with mm -hmm. like using genetics and physiology and whatnot and I think I try to bring that into our programs and um, other programs so that I like because that's my background and that's that's what I what I believe um, and speaking of which I like at Guelph uh, aside from just doing the marine and freshwater major, I did a uh, neuroscience as well as a psychology minor. Um, and those developed my interest in how internal factors like hormones and genes alter behavior and ecology. Oh, so very complimentary. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, that's basically what it was. Like I had taken an animal physiology course. We got to the neuroscience section or neuroendocrinology section, mm -hmm. which is the study of the nervous system as well as hormones and I was like that's my type of thing where yeah. you can look at what's happening on the inside mm -hmm. and relate that to what's going on on the outside yeah so, I think it's really interesting for our endocrine system how we can pinpoint what hormone causes what response and I like the specificity of it where you can just see like this does <laughs> this I love that, I find that but it cool. doesn't <laughs> like, that's actually how it works it like, yes. that seems too simple, <laughs> it's too simple well a bit like can you explain that to me then? So, you say that hormone A yeah. causes hormone B, or causes behavior B, yeah. but hormone A also causes behavior C, D, E, and F. Well, yeah, they're all connected. And you have hormone B that affects hormone, or that affects behavior mm -hmm. C, E, and F, we'll say. Yeah. Oh, but and so... <laughs> You can say, yes, that this hormone is likely involved in this behavior, but it's also involved in a number of other behaviors mm -hmm. and then all these other... It, it's a network. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a network. So you, it's not... It's definitely not specific. A network. By any means. That's cool. Are, um, are the fish hormone network as complicated as the human yep. hormone oh, network? Oh, good! <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep, it is. It is. That's incredible. Well, yeah. it, my graduate research was on neuroendocrinology looking at the molecular basis of appetite regulation in fish. Okay. And then having the history of genetics that I did, fish are unique where they have undergone multiple genome duplication events. So where humans would have one gene copy, mm -hmm. fish could have two, they could have four, or if you look at someone, if they have eight or up to eight copies of that gene, of that one gene. Why or how is that? Evolution. That's just what happened evolutionarily. And that is also what intrigued me about doing molecular biology and working with fish and especially working with someone. It's because you have this one gene in a human that regulates a hormone and it can release that hormone. But then in fish, salmonids, you have up to eight copies of this gene. Mm -hmm. Some of them are still present in their genome. Some of them have been, are, are not present anymore. They're gone. And some of these genes are, turn on, some of them turn off. Some of them, 
still work the same way that they do in humans, where, for example, you've got a hormone that regulates appetite in humans. One copy can regulate appetite in fish. The other copy can regulate re reproduction in fish. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of complexities that drew me to my graduate research because you've got all these different things happening and um, being able to say, okay, I have hormone A, I have this many copies of it in this fish, and what does it do? And how, does it, how is it affecting fish behavior? So, and which species did you use in your graduate studies? In, yeah, in my graduate studies I did winter flounder as well as Atlantic cod because I was in Newfoundland. Mm -hmm. So in Newfoundland, like New Brunswick, they have their sentinel fish, which is the Atlantic cod that has undergone gone huge population declines since mm -hmm. the 1990s and they're mm -hmm. still trying to recover. And those fish basically are what, like, it, that's what a lot, most people study in Newfoundland because they're still trying to help and figure out what's going on mm -hmm. yeah. with them. And at one point they were trying to develop an agriculture industry for them. While I was in school, that was the big thing, trying to develop this agriculture industry and figuring out how it can work and whatnot. It never actually came to fruition, but I got to a master's and a PhD out of it, and it was super exciting. That is. But yeah, so that's where, that's my background, and that's where my career started as a biologist. Like, I have always been looking at the small things and trying to relate them to the big things. Mm -hmm. And now I'm kind of working backwards as a biologist and taking the big picture and saying, okay, what little things could be affecting this big behavior or the survival and whatnot. Mm -hmm. that's, <laughs> that's basically what my background is and what led to be a scientist. Now, as an undergrad student, how strenuous or how different is it to complete a PhD versus an undergrad degree? Or is it just a breeze? That is we're it all just a breeze? breeze. <laughs> it's not a breeze. Whip up the dissertation in one night. <laughs> yeah, no, it's definitely not a breeze. It just depends on where your passion and your focus lies. Mm -hmm. Depends on what you want to do, what intrigues you. I loved research. I have always been that person that asks a lot of questions and I'll hear something and be like, okay, well, what is causing that? And just trying to like mm -hmm. figure out all these things. I have a list of, list of research questions that I'm just I like, I want to answer, yeah. but I can't. Yeah. <laughs> I find that's quite easy to do in biology where you can just be like, well, what about this? And what about this? Because like yeah. you said earlier, so many, there's so many, yeah, interplaying yeah. factors. You can be like, you can question everything. Yep. Yeah. So, so doing an undergrad it's studying it's learning the concepts mm -hmm. but also when doing an undergrad you have the opportunity to do research yeah. because you have the research courses you have your honors theses yeah um just depends on what university you're at and how they mm -hmm. take that into consideration in your degree but in my undergrad i did a field course i did a couple undergrad research projects and really got exposed to research and especially in your labs you learn about you do little research projects yeah. there. So yeah. that I knew is what I wanted to do as soon as I left undergrad. Mm -hmm. So I did my master's and PhD and again, like it's research focused. It's not easy. No. You are still like you're learning, especially like with your masters, you're you're still learning, you're learning the concepts, you're learning you're developing your writing. And you're just learning how to become a scientist and you develop a lot of other skills too, like you, as a master's student or graduate student, you typically have to be a teaching assistant. So you learn how to teach. Mm -hmm. You learn how to communicate. All different skills that like you wouldn't expect. Exactly, you don't expect that. When you think you are going into a master's program, you think that you're going to do research and that's it. But then conferences happen and you have to go and make a poster or yeah. make a presentation and yeah. talk to people yeah. about your research. Well, that's what's great about science is we have to communicate our findings. We can't just like, oh, discovered this, but I'm not going to show anybody. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly. that's yeah. the benefit of conferences. Yeah. Exactly. Like conferences, I would prefer those over publishing a paper because you can talk about negative results, like results that nothing, you found nothing. Yeah, knowledge but gaps. But there's yeah. still... Like, even though you found nothing, there's still something significant about that. Whereas yeah. paper, you can't publish 
a study that nothing happened. Yeah. Right. Even though there, it says, you know, like, yeah. if you do something and you get no response, that's still... Yeah, no response is still a result. It's still a result, yeah. but you still, like... It's harder to publish something like that. Yeah, unless right. you, yes, so. very true. You won't get published. I didn't exactly. I wouldn't have thought about it like that. Yeah. So, so you find you can really elaborate the like everything in a conference. For sure. If you're speaking orally with someone, like I can quickly do that with you guys here. Whereas if I'm trying to write a paper, it's like no, for months. You just, like yeah, you can do like it's quickly. It, communication is a lot quicker with conferences, and then with writing, it just can be a forever process mm -hmm. but yeah like it it just depends on what you're trying to get across mm -hmm. and the nice thing about conferences is if you have multiple papers you can that all tell a similar story mm -hmm. you can combine them and say this is my story mm -hmm. of course so whereas if one well you can do that with papers but again there's limitations what is the biggest challenge you find in trying to communicate your research and what you do scientifically like is it trying to find all the limits terms or <laughs> Uh, it's difficult. You obviously <laughs> think about that. Like the, the, I, I do find that I don't find it as difficult anymore because during my research, I did a lot of conferences. I took advantage of everything so that mm -hmm. I could communicate, learn to communicate better to people, whether it be other scientists, whether it be the public, to say, okay, this is what I'm doing. This is how I'm doing it, and this is what I found in as basic terms as possible so that people can understand me. Yeah. Um, it's just having people want to listen to you, I guess. Like, I've, I've gone to events where I, it's like community events, and I'm there to, like, talk to people about our programs, because I'm excited, I'm passionate, I'm, mm -hmm. I love what I'm doing. And people aren't interested in it. Then it's hard for me. Like, it's, I try to, I want people to be as interested in it as I am, and not just come up for the free stuff. Right? Like, I want to be able to mm -hmm. talk to people and say, this is our story, this is what we're doing. So it, it's more frustrating when, more frustrating that people don't have that passion and, and just trying to get, or even, like, don't even want to learn mm -hmm. about our programs and, and whatnot. So, But your passion is great, I'm sure, and inspiring that way. Like, I mean, yeah. how are you going to listen to somebody unless they're passionate about yeah. it? Like, that really yeah. brings something. I find a huge that's... difference in professors who are passionate about what they're teaching versus a monotone professor. Mm -hmm. And I can learn better from the passionate professor because I'm more engaged. Yeah. So I'm sure that comes across as you're speaking to them, but sometimes people just are in their own world, I guess. <laughs> sure. yeah, if, they're not, if they're not scientists and if they're not in that field, it might be even that. It's not even that. It's not that. It depends on like the. It depends on the situation. It depends on yeah, okay. the people and things. So if if I'm in the right situation, like here, I can just talk to you guys, yeah. and you want to hear it because we are is, super stoked. <laughs> yeah. So, but in other situations where it's more of a. We're just, it's not the same crowd. Like, those are the ones that are more disheartening for me and mm. make communication. Yes. But so. even the fact that it is disheartening makes you, like, an incredible individual to want to make that bridge. Yeah. Like, somebody could not care about that. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really, I think it's great. Thanks. <laughs> so, what led or inspired you to work with the Department of Fisheries and Ocean after all of this? Yes. After your PhD? Yeah. <laughs> Did you go right from your PhD to DFO? No. 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 I, uh, what did I do? I finished my PhD and then I ended up working with the Canadian Rivers Institute for a bit. Where is that located manager. in the Maritimes as well? It's, it's actually located at the University of Brunswick. Okay. And um, I was actually a training manager, so I wasn't training in professional development manager. I wasn't actually doing any science. Uh, I was wow. learning how to manage. Is that really hard? Or like hard on your heart? <laughs> uh, it was a good period. Might have been a good break it after a good PhD. Break. Did you sure. miss it though? Oh, I missed it, it definitely, because I was still working in like an aquatic science field mm -hmm. and was speaking with researchers on a regular basis and it was, I wanted to get back into it and it would be like, yeah. you know, if there's anything I could do on the side, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'd love to be able to yeah. help you still. And I could still use some of my, my scientific brain to talk with them and whatnot, but... Um, so still using that muscle. Yeah. yeah, exactly. But yeah, no, I, it was a good break. Like I said, it 
anything I've always done, it's always been to try and build me as a as an individual and build like learn new skills. So taking on that job helped build my management skills. It helped it was my first kind of my first real job out of university. So it was just getting that experience working. <laughs> I also worked at a consulting firm for a little bit, so that just broadened my skill set as well, where I was working not just with fish, I was working with inverts and doing a number of different Ask, answering a number of different res other research questions that were not fish related, so that that helped as well. And just seeing another industry and being able to say, okay, this is what this industry does. This is how it works, mm -hmm. and being able to apply those to future employment opportunities. Basically, how I got started with uh, DFO is I, after graduating, I had to start to look for work. Someone had recommended starting to follow the DFO job postings and apply for processes that I saw. I applied for a lot of processes. <laughs> you go through in 10 minutes, you start to go through a lot of them. And then in winter 2016, I got a phone call asking if I wanted to go work at the MACDEFAC biodiversity facility for a maternity leave hire. And I took it because it was getting me back into science and um, just a new, another new challenge, another new avenue, avenue way to method to build skills. Mm -hmm. So, like I said, you, see, you sound very well rounded. You're not very just <laughs> research. It's like management, yeah. research, communication, outreach. It's I, great. Yeah, I like that's again my whole philosophy is holistic. <laughs> so <laughs> right. I guess that that's how I've built. I've tried to build myself yeah, as awesome. as a person. I like to dabble in a lot of things. I like to do kind of like jack of all trades as well. That makes you very employable. I can do everything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or like willing to do things. Yeah, I'm willing, willing to, to learn. learn. Yeah. I think that's the best I'm thing. I'm willing to learn yeah. to take on new qualities. Like that, to learn. That's definitely something that if you have that quality, you can do anything. Yeah. That's a good um, sign of, or a good kind of humility. <laughs> yeah, it just like I said to you guys before the interview started, my background is not what I'm doing now, and did you see that coming, or did you thought you would always stay? Uh, in, I had no idea what I was going to do. No. <laughs> so that never say, comes away. <laughs> yeah, I was just um, I was just going to flow. I had the opportunity to work at the fish at Mactaquac. I took it. Huge learning curve. Very good experience. But the thing that kept me, even though it wasn't entirely in my field, was the team that I worked with. They were awesome. The section, my salmon section, that's in the population ecology division, everyone is fantastic to work with. So I worked my butt off to try and learn what I had to learn and do what I needed to do to try and stay within the group and continue continue my employment and my career with them. And that's where I was offered this position that I'm in now with Salmon Assessment Unit. I was offered the position after that term and I took it and haven't looked back since. How are you Pretty settling happy. into your role? You said you've been with the DFO for about a year in this particular position? No, I I had a six month term with MACDAQUAC and then I in October I moved into this position oh, okay. Okay. as a maternity leave. Higher, and my term has been extended, which until uh, November at this point. And settling into this position, position again, it was huge learning curve because it was all salmon ecology, and it's been challenging, but it's been good. I have a great supervisor, Ross Jones, who has lots of patience for me <laughs> to teach me <laughs> all this. Is stuff, his background in salmon ecology? Yeah, yeah, he's been with the department for. A number of years, yes. so okay. he uh, he is a great mentor, and has taught me everything I know now about the assessment. And with like obviously, there's challenges. I have to learn a whole bunch of new skills, but like I said, that's something that I enjoy doing, and it's been great. It's been my I guess my first real dig back in science, and it's made me not want to get out of science again. So, aw, it's, uh, yeah. That's, That's good. great. That's awesome. 
Um, what conservation efforts have you taken part in and are you personally interested in? As I mentioned, my initial work with conservation mm -hmm. was in Newfoundland with Atlantic Cod. Mm -hmm. So trying to, obviously it's a contentious issue, but to develop a sustainable aquaculture industry for cod would help the, potentially help the wild populations. So that's when I first got into it. What were the plans for that like? You said that never really came to fruition, but what was the, I don't know, foundation for the aquaculture for Atlantic cod specifically? Well, the, it's similar to salmon where yeah. fishermen can go out, leave their nets for a few days and catch like 20 fish as opposed to thousands of fish or hundreds of fish. So it's pretty much been similar declines. Um, Although it happened earlier than salmon, and I think it was much more drastic where it was just like a flip of the switch. They were decimated. Mm -hmm. A lot of it was overfishing. Yeah. Whereas here, it's probably not the same type of situation. But yeah, it's that was my first kind of experience, I guess, with conservation and research and things like that. Like obviously, I've always been an animal lover and whatnot, so. Conservation has always been a big thing in my life. But Can um, conservation work ever get a little disheartening with our society we have today and our impacts on the environment? It's definitely disheartening. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely, it's hard. It's yeah. hard to see like what's happening and. But does that fuel your drive to kind of keep going For in sure. your career? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, especially since like if we can come up with some sort of solution. Like, I guess the main thing that I really like about being government as opposed to academia is the fact that I actually get to, I get do, to do applied <laughs> applied research where yeah. things that I'm doing now can actually make a difference mm -hmm. in a population mm -hmm. whereas in academia you do a bunch of research people may take it into your, consideration they may take yeah. it into consideration but they may not and yeah. it's probably not going to <laughs> affect any big plans because it's it's pretty much the pro, like, yeah. So I I like the fact that things that I projects that I'm working on now can actually mean something mm -hmm. and affect conservation efforts and programs and, and things like that. So it's disheartening because I know that there's so much stuff going on and that we may not be able to make a difference. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, at least we're trying. We're trying right mm -hmm. now. Yeah, I and, we try. And, DFO is actively trying with our programs and we're doing what we can in order to help all the salmon populations in particular. Mm -hmm. And could you just explain the complicated nature of like fish food webs and how one species can actually impact the entire marine ecosystem? Because I know for a lot of people, I know that's a really huge question, <laughs> but I know maybe for our listeners might just think, oh, that's just one fish species, like what's the big deal? It's true. Could you just explain like why it's so important? It's important because if you look at a salmon, it is going to eat smaller fish and it'll eat smaller, it'll eat birds and whatnot. It would keep a population in check. You guys are really making me think of college <laughs> undergrad. But then salmon are also a prey item for their predators. Everything works together. That was using salmon as an example, but then you also have these other predators, but there's only a few of them, but they're also going to make sure that other populations stay in check. And that's why certain species are important. You don't want to get rid of them. Any top predators, you don't want them to disappear. Like you look at the killer whales out west where there's 76 of them left. And that, that, with that population, if they go, then you're gonna have lots of the little guys that are that they would have eaten just explode. Yeah, because like there's the, nothing. The krill, the eat. krill, correct? Uh, killer whales, they eat like they eat like they otters, because that's a yeah. big example they use. Is the if the orcas go, then the otters are crazy, and then they eat all the sea urchins, or they yep. whatever, and then those are crazy, and they take all away all the algae, and it's like everything exactly. is it's, completely... It's a pyramid. Yeah. You take away the base of the pyramid, which would be your big predators, mm -hmm. and everything else is just going to fall apart. Yeah. Lauren's are a shark expert, so... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's the same shark. Yeah. I find... I don't know if this is true. Like, in my biased opinion, I find that marine food webs especially are so delicate just because 
-hmm. that like if you remove one single thing, it's just everything's out of whack. And it's yeah. like a lot of people don't realize that because it's not so, you okay. can't see it happening right away. Yeah. But. And I don't think it's just marine, it's any food. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like any food where you remove something and something is going to get affected. Like that's why it's called a food web. You look yeah. at a spider mm -hmm. web, you remove one piece of the spider web, the it's whole gonna thing's going to fall apart. Yeah. And that's how you have to think about any sort of species, any sort of animal, any animal. It doesn't matter if you're talking about a little invert, a bacteria, a big whale. You take any of those away and they're they're either a prey for something, they're a predator, predator for something, and something could expand or be decimated because of it. Mm -hmm. And that could be what's also affecting the salmon. Like, they may not have that the prey that they need to eat like that's a question that really hasn't been addressed yet is food intake or their prey items is that changing is that affecting our salmon have we been focusing on their habitat is that it, a lot of its habitat and, and water and, temperature yeah climate change yeah. predators exactly rather it's than just the smaller the, things yeah like it, it's trying to figure out what you can see, right, rather than what you can't see. And, and it just depends too on people's backgrounds and the, basically the mandates of the mandates and research that people are doing. Mm -hmm. Like you can't, you can't study everything. No. <laughs> so it's just trying to figure out what the priorities are. I have one that might be a bit of a loaded question, but work with COD and were we, were you able, was anybody able to really look at the cod population and learn from that to kind of help with the salmon? I have no idea. <laughs> I'm sure people have looked at it. And that's more of the how, how things have been regulated. Okay. And they probably, like they, I suspect they would be using the same thing, given it's two different circumstances. Cod, we pretty much know it's overfishing. That's, yeah. So we okay. know that it's overfishing. But salmon's mm -hmm. a bit more of a, like, what's happening. It's it's different because it's a different time. It's 20 years later. Yeah. And we have more overfishing regulations than we had in place at, during the COD. Sure. Yep, exactly. So it's more, and it and again, we know that it's a question of what factors. Like there, yeah. We know all these different factors. Mm -hmm. Now we need to say, see which factors are which one playing a role. Yeah. Or if multiple are... Going exactly. into the bigger. Yeah, exactly. When do you guys expect to see results from your current research studies with the salmon? So basically, what people know about is the Fundy Salmon Recovery that parks are doing. That's what's broadcasted. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, DFO, we kind of hide in the background, but we have our we do have programs that we are running in order to help save the salmon on our own rivers. Our big program with the Inner Bay of Fundy is the Live Gene Bank, is what it's called. So basically, over 15 years ago, this program was started when we knew that the populations were declining and we had to start to intervene and try to figure out a way to conserve them. Mm -hmm. In the Inner Bay of Fundy, there's over 50, there's about 50 rivers that are designated as potential rivers that, are, that could host Atlantic salmon. And within these 50 rivers, we picked three rivers, the Big Salmon River in New Brunswick, the Stewiak River, and the Gaspar Rivers in uh, Nova Scotia. Those are the three rivers that basically DFO uses as our, our index rivers, our, our rivers to assess salmon populations. From those rivers, we developed our DFO, our section, developed this program called the Live G Bank. That program was designed to try and use conservation genetics in order to create a, a supplementation program to these rivers. So what happened was fish adults were taken from a number of Inner Bay of Fundy rivers. They were brought to our two biodiversity facilities, Mactaquac down in Fredericton, Coldbrook out Brook, Nova Scotia, mm -hmm. and these fish were mated. Before mating happened, though, they looked at the genetics of these fish. 
in order to say, okay, who are these individuals? And, and like, would they be a good match? Let's make good matches based on their genetics. So See, did you guys look for, I forget the word you used earlier about those kind of bad genes. Did you no, look for those and if they would come across no, those mates? So with conservation genetics, like if you think about genetics that they use in like artificial breeding, in, if you are like in an in a aquaculture program, in an aquaculture program you're going to breed fish so that they grow bigger and they grow bigger quick. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In a conservation genetics program, which look for survival. The, no, right. you don't no. look for anything. Oh, you don't. Okay. With conservation genetics, you say, okay, these are all the genetic signatures I see. We want to conserve those. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So you're not so trying we, to manipulate. You're not to trying to manipulate gotcha. anything. You're trying to make sure that you keep the population as genetically natural as possible. And as genetically diverse as possible. For sure, exactly. Like you're gonna But without look, manipulation, I guess. Yeah, right. you're gonna look at your original population and say, okay, this is what it looks like. How are we going to create a mating plan in order to maintain what we're seeing now? Mm -hmm. It's a tall order. Yeah, it's it's pretty crazy. Like they've only obviously we've only done it on three rivers because it's 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 a big project. It's a right. big it takes a lot of work. <laughs> and we have a genetics unit. And do they map the genome first? You kind of it's look at those been genes? Yeah. It's been mapped? Yeah, so basically what happens is they pick a panel of, I think it's 15 genes for the inner bay of Fundy, that they will screen okay. adults using these, using these genetic markers to say, okay, what are we seeing for the signatures of these adults? And then they make a mating plan based on that in order to ins ensure that they're conserving they're conserving the genetics. So um, they've done that successfully with the Big Salmon River, Stuyak, Gaspro. That's how this program started. They pulled fish from a number of the Ivoff rivers, Interbay Fundy rivers, developed this mating plan, and that was their founder population of fish that were going back into the rivers. Mm -hmm. That brings me to the next thing where you have this founder population, you need to start to feed fish into this into the into this program. So that's where my unit comes in and we collect smolts in the spring. In the fall we collect par and then throughout the adult run, which is typically summer and fall, they also collect adults that we can bring back to the biodiversity facilities for integration into the program. Typically the best would be to collect the smolts because they're in the facilities for a shorter period of time. Could you just run through the life cycle of the salmon really quickly for some people who aren't familiar? Sure, yes. I'm not familiar yeah, with yeah, the bar yeah. is. I I'm trying to think of where is that in the life That's, cycle? Yeah, <laughs> and I wasn't either. <laughs> so basically, you have your adults that are that have migrated back from the sea mm -hmm. and they are in the river. They will spawn in the river and then they lay their eggs. Um, lay their eggs, they spawn, and then that gives rise to fry, which okay. are your babies. And then fry within the year will turn into par, okay. which are your like pre-teenager pre -teen, pre juveniles basically. Then par within one to three years are smolt, okay. go, or the life stage that go out to sea. To and then return back as adults? And return back as adults. Oh, okay. They go out to sea to grow because that's where all the food is. Mm -hmm. right. So they go out, they get big, they either come back their first year as a gross or one sea winter salmon, or their second year as a two sea winter, multi sea winter salmon. So that's the basic life cycle of mm -hmm. a salmon. Uh, salmon always go back to the river where they were born. It's called homing. Mm -hmm. um, That's an interesting behavior of theirs. Is yeah, that, does that get complicated with like the system? Like, do they want it? Like, is it, it, it gets complicated when you release them. Like, sometimes they've seen fish go back to the hatchery. Wow. Or go back mm -hmm. to the. Um, and they, just because that's where I they know. were born, right? Yeah. The natural instinct. Natural Home instinct. Coming. So, um, but it's for the most part, what happens is we've got adults that are in the hatchery, they get spawned, we maintain their eggs until they turn into fry, until they hatch and are fry. And once they hit a certain age as fry, then we release them. Because you don't want these fish to stay in the hatchery very long 
because that impacts causes, their genes. Correct. It impacts their yeah. genes because they're going to adapt to the hatchery yeah. instead of to the wild. So and it makes it, them less like it makes likely. them more domesticated. Yes. Domestication is what it's called. Yeah, it's like a dog. Was, yeah, yeah. trying to. It would make them to more us. likely to survive in the hatchery versus surviving in the wild because they're two different environments. That's wilderness exactly. hardy. Exactly. Yes, they're not, in, not, like, they're not in the river, so yeah. Yeah. that environment isn't impacting their genes, their, genes, yeah. their survival. Yeah, the hatchery is like factors that are happening. The hatchery would cause the fish to die, so you don't want that. You want fish to get out into the rivers as soon as possible. So more recently, we've been diverting our programs to releasing unfit fry and releasing adults, mature adults, so that they can spawn in the river because you want that type of breeding. However, in the past, some of these fry have been maintained until smolt, so the teenager, the teenager salmon. And how and did that go with releasing the smolt versus releasing the fry? Did you see a big difference? Basically, what you would see if you release a fry compared to a car, compared to a smolt, you're going to see less domestication. It's more behaviorally. Mm -hmm. um, the genetics that they look at, that we look at in our program, is like I said, conservation genetics. It's a panel of markers that have that are are quite diverse, and give us a good indication of the genetic diversity of the fish, so or of the population, and that's what we focus on. So until you kind of look at, like you backtrack, you look at the different releases, and you look at their markers and a bigger range of genes, you won't really know how that impacted the population, but theoretically, if you release a smolt, it's going to have more domestication than a par or a fry. So our programs now focus on unfed fry. We used to release par and smolt. We still, in some of our programs, release smolt, but for the most part, or par, but in the inner bay of Fundy, live gene banks, we focus on releasing unfed fry. And then what we'll do is... In the springs, we collect smolt, so the assessment unit. We are, our number one priority is assessing the population and assessing this program and figuring out how it's working. So we are enumerating smolt. But then the second priority is to collect smolt to bring back into the program so that we can increase that genetic pool. We increase the number of fish because fish grow, they get older, they die. Mm -hmm. You need to continue to replenish what is the, the hatchery. Uh, lifetime expectancy of a salmon? So they can live six plus years, just based on what I know. For the most part, they're going to live six years, just because of the marine conditions. Right. They could live longer when the marine In conditions In a perfect improve. condition, yeah. Okay. Yep. So, so yeah, so we collect smolts at our smolt wheels in the spring, and then... Yeah, we collect smolts at the small, at our small wheels in the spring. In the fall, there are some electrofishing. We do some electrofishing and collect par to bring back to the hatchery if we need to. And they are both raised until adults. They'll assess their genetics. If they can use them in the program, they'll keep them, breed them, and then release them. If they can't, or depending on their genetics, if they think that they need to retain them, they could also retain them at the hatchery for future breeding. Basically, if their genetic signature is a popular one, then they'll probably release it back into the river so that it can spawn naturally, and then they won't keep it. There's no reason to. So we only keep the minimal amount at the hatchery in order to make our breeding, our programs work and to make sure that we conserve our genetic pool. How long has this program been in place? Over 15 years. So is it becoming more efficient over time? It's basically been pretty, like, they made the changes, like, so that they reduced domestication and whatnot. Right. We just had a big 15-year review of the program, and now they're kind of coming up with some recommendations as, as to what to do for the next five years. And yeah, like, it's more efficient, yet yeah, we've definitely learned. We you continue awesome. to learn about what you see and what you do, which is why... We've changed from releasing small to par to just unfed fry mm -hmm. and trying to get mature adults into the river and things like that. So it's always dynamic. Right. But the main premise of the program is to try and conserve the inner bay of Fundy genes mm -hmm. in these uh, different in these different rivers. Do you have a lot of people working on this project? I assume it probably takes a lot of professionals. <laughs> uh, we, we're a pretty small unit. Like the, okay. the salmon section is pretty small. There's Right now, we only have one person in our genetics unit that kind of does all the genetics. We partner with a lab in Dartmouth called the Aquatic Biotechnology Lab, 
they do all the uh, molecular analyses for us, and then, or they do all the molecular assays, and then our geneticist Louise, she um, analyzes all the results, and then we have our little assessment unit. Uh, Ross and I basically focus on IBA on the Innovate on this program, whereas there's another assessment unit in Fredericton that focuses on the Outer Bay. Mm -hmm. Did you call them IBOF? IBOF, yeah. Is that the acronym? <laughs> That's yes. the acronym. Yeah. I've just been trying not to use any acronyms. <laughs> oh, it's so fun. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and then you have the hatchery staff, which probably make up the largest component of our programs because right. they're the ones that have to rear the fish and make sure that they survive. So you have a number of people working at Colebrook and Mactaquac. Mm -hmm. um, do you monitor the fish overnight, or is it just kind of oh, like no, is there they, is someone always with them? No, not always with them. Like overnight, they there isn't like they're not that needy. Needy, needy. <laughs> but there is like it's a baby huge, monitor set up. Yeah, you know, <laughs> it's a huge it's a huge process. Like yeah, yeah the hatchery imagine. staff um, they do a great job. They have been doing a wonderful job trying to figure out ways in order to improve hatchery settings so that it's not so much a hatchery but and more like the wild yeah trying oh, to figure really out doing research on their own and making sure that we are putting the best salmon we can into the rivers right. that are not domesticated and that are as close to uh, the natural population as possible that's great so yeah and that's kind of our that's the salmon section and that's basically like the live like i said the live gene bank is is our program mm -hmm. for bringing salmon back and I also think I need I need to talk about the Petticodiac. Yeah, I was just going to say, so the Petticodiac River yes, region. <laughs> exactly. So, as I said, the Petticodiac is part of the Innovate Funding. Mm -hmm. And as I also mentioned, we work very closely with Fort Folly Habitat Recovery, whose main focus is the Petticodiac. Um, they have been a big partner of ours for a long time. I, I was going to say this earlier, but I think it's great that you guys partner with other organizations. I feel like that really helps, you know, propel us and science and communication. I think it's awesome. Yeah, it's great for that. And it's also necessary, basically, for, for us to run our yeah. programs. Like, yeah. we don't have the capacity in order to be able to be on multiple rivers all mm -hmm. at once because mm -hmm. just we just don't have the number of people. So Small and mighty, but still. Yeah, forming these collaborations is is essential for right. this program to run. So we partner with Fort Folly on the Petticodiac, or on um, Big Salmon River and obviously mm -hmm. Petticodiac. And then we partner with the Mi'kmaq Conservation Group and Stuyak. And we partner with uh, Acadia on the Gaspar River. And then there's a number of First Nation partners that we have in the OWASP that I'm not even going to try and get into. But the fact that we partner with Fort Folly on the Big Salmon River has helped the Petticodiac program. Fort Folly has been trying to get fish in, or trying to grow the population in Petticodia, the salmon population in Petticodiac for a number of years. Basically, how DFO has supported that program is by um, supplying excess juveniles, adults, anything that gets really, basically any adults from our Big Salmon River live mm -hmm. bank program that are not required in that program anymore and get released into the Petticodiac. Mm -hmm. Um, any excess unfed fry or smolt that we have will go into the Petticodiac to try and help that program out because it is one of the rivers that they've designated as a priority river for the Innovative Funny Salmon Recovery. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so that's where we help the Petticodiac. We also try to help them with any technical support and whatnot that they need on the river and trying to just do whatever we can in order to increase the salmon numbers there. And like I said, the Pollitt and the Little River are the two main tributaries that we focus on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now that Petticodiac has been working with the uh, with Parks on their funny salmon recovery, some of our big salmon river smolt go into their Grand Manan site mm -hmm. just to try and help them get numbers. But we are hoping that well, we know that they had a number of smolts leave the river this year, so hopefully they get a number of adults back and they can just keep using their Petticodiac fish mm -hmm. because that is the genetic population. Like that's Those fish are adapting to the Petticodiac, so we want to keep supporting that program wherever we can to try and help that population grow. 
I know we kept you over it. I'm so sorry, okay. but thank you. I had a, uh, a weird question, if you wouldn't mind. So you're expecting, congratulations. <laughs> Well, are you excited to be a science mom? Like, what are you hoping? <laughs> I, I love that mom? term. Yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is baby number two. Oh, oh my God. Yeah, baby number That's two. That's fantastic. My first baby is, uh, he just turned two. And that is the cutest age. <laughs> oh, he's pretty awesome. <laughs> Until they hit three, he's nature. <laughs> no, no, no. He's, he's uh, it's awesome being around him at this age. Because when they're starting to really look at their environment around them and understand it on a, like, a, like they're interacting more. Children are like, the first this? scientists. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, they, uh, they're a science mom. It's it's fun. Like I, my partner is also a salmon salmon biologist by trade. Now, just more of a environmental scientist, and he, we both, obviously, are nerds. And um, <laughs> I love it. Our yeah, it's good. Son has definitely. I don't know if you definitely deserve needs. that title. You, you, did, you did a PhD. Yeah. So you deserve <laughs> that title. That's for right. sure. But uh, you can definitely see in our son, his, like, he loves being outside and he's always looking at all the insects and picking them up. And last night we went on a walk and he brings his wagon and picks up worms and leaves and sticks awesome. and everything. Any little nature thing goes in there in his Love wagon. So, it's already learning uh, about the food plant. <laughs> he he oh, is. Okay. Like, it's. It, and he's just so super, super interested in it. That must be really nice for you being so passionate about your work. And yeah, it's, it's nice to see that it's rubbed off. <laughs> <laughs> Again, whether or not it's been because of the environment and our influence or whether it's genetic. His genes, you know? I was just about to say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, no, being a science mom, like it, it's, it's good. It's, um, it's challenging to the work-life balance mm -hmm. when you're trying to balance your career mm -hmm. and family life and have the energy when you're expecting. It's a lot of changes in two years. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it's a bit. Yeah. It's been a lot. I've, um, I had started my first job at CRI when I was five months pregnant and Girl. that was also challenging in itself. But yeah, like it's just, it's a lot of change and but it's all exciting changes and it just you just have to have energy and keep pushing through but i wouldn't change any of it so good for it's, you uh, it's fun what are you hoping to pass down to him in passion wise or just respect your environment and like yes, just be aware yeah. of what's going on in the what's going on around you and not be tunnel vision and just um awareness i guess just always being aware and Never, like, don't ever think that uh, you can't do anything or you can't do something because you aren't trained or you, you haven't learned it. Like, mm -hmm. just always stay strong and learn it. And if you put your mind to something, you can, you'll definitely be able to do it. And that's how I've always lived my life. And I hope that he does the same. And I can already see it in him where he'll, he's trying to figure out he'll try to figure out things on his own and it's not always like he'll say mama need help but then uh he'll go and he'll just figure it out on his own oh, and just uh, watch him do things like that and that'd be so cool to watch a kid like problem solve <laughs> like it what is, is this <laughs> how much is this yeah, you can see, the, see the little wheels turning <laughs> yeah, the wheels are turning yeah That's so and uh it's just it's awesome when you see it and yeah when you see him like at two years old solving his own problems and <laughs> do whatever he wants well thank you so much for joining us on this podcast and no thanks problem. for entertaining all of our questions <laughs> no problem hopefully I answered them all right okay, definitely <laughs> absolutely did.